Hello, and welcome to the Slate Political Gab Fest. January 12th, 2023, the Weaponize the Government edition. I am David Plotz of CityCast. I would like to weaponize the D.C. metro system. I'm joined by John Dickerson of CBS Primetime from New York City. John, what part of the government would you like to weaponize? I would like to weaponize the government that um, provides quick and immediate relief to uh, lower back pain. It's a small office, not often heard from. Emily Bazelon of the New York Times Magazine and Yale University Law School in New Haven. What part of the government are you going to weaponize, Emily? Hmm. Department of Justice, obviously. To do your bidding. To do my bidding. How about to just do some justice? I get to say what that is. That sounds good. This week on the Gap Fest, House Republicans get off to a weird and alarming start uh, under under Speaker Kevin McCarthy, even as Joe Biden discovers that he has been hiding a lot of old secret documents. Then we'll talk to Brazilian scholar Marcus Nobre about the protests and insurrections in his country. Then the implications of Prince Harry's memoir Spare on the Anglo-American alliance, i.e. how sorry should you feel for Prince Harry? Or not even Prince Harry anymore. I guess he's not even a prince. Plus, of course, we'll have cocktail chatter, which I think is everything with royal should just be cocktail chatter, honestly. Kevin McCarthy may be Speaker of the House, but it is clear that his House of Representatives will be run by other people, Jim Jordan and the Jordanaires. Since finally electing McCarthy as Speaker, the House GOP majority has gotten off to a bang up start. If by bang up, you mean creating a committee with subpoena powers to investigate the, quote, weaponization of the government, launching the first of what promises to be infinite numbers of investigations of the Biden family, uh, proposing the impeachment of the Homeland Security Secretary and moving to defund the IRS. John, uh, always houses and, and Congress always gets off to this sort of very symbolic showy start where they do a ton of stuff in the first week. Um, Which of the, the, things that McCarthy's house has done feels to you like most consequential? Well, I think this committee is the most consequential because of the powers it's been given. That doesn't mean it's going to do consequential work, but it's consequential in the sense that it will, it will, because lawmaking is going to be so locked up by the thin majority and the fact that Democrats control the Senate and the Republicans control the house that, that a lot of the action over the next couple of years will be um, in the, in the committee investigative area. Um, other than the big fights we're going to have over the debt limit and government funding. But um, so so I think that creating this committee is a big deal. And just remind us what the committee is. It's the Jim Jordan Committee. Yeah, it's the it's the Jim Jordan Committee uh, on the weaponization of um, what he what they call the weaponization of the federal government. Jordan has said that he doesn't want to, um, you know, this isn't a fishing expedition, but that his interest is in simply, quote, protecting the First Amendment. Um, But the subcommittee is um, incredibly open ended. And what's interesting about that is from covering the Hill, there are lots of committees that are supposed to cover the things that Jordan is going to go look into. Um, So normally you would have lots of turf wars and turf battles and also on a normally functioning Congress, there are committees that have jurisdiction to over to have oversight, um, uh, including the Government Reform Committee, that that should be doing all this stuff anyway. Um, so, so it, the 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 committee's kind of um, fluid nature uh, will make it irritating. Lots of the existing committee chairs, except that they obviously want to use this for. Um, you know, political reasons. And so um, it may be helpful to the larger Republican cause as they see it. So, Emily, if we cast our minds back to the Trump era and the Trump era when there were uh, parts of the House and Senate that were controlled by Democrats, there were all kinds of investigations of the Trump administration's or demands that Trump officials testify. And what we saw was kind of massive resistance by the Trump administration. They just defied requests for documents. They defied requests for information. They went to court to prevent anyone from having to testify ever. They resisted subpoenas, resistance that has continued even unto the Biden administration under for certain kinds of uh, investigations. Um, Do you think we should expect to see the Biden administrations to be just Biden administration to be just as recalcitrant and resistant and legally wily in resisting House Republicans as the Trump administration was? 
I think pretty much yes. And what's going to be tricky here is that, you know, whether you should comply with these subpoenas or other orders, whether you should participate in an investigation is partly about how legitimate the investigation is. But nobody is going to agree about that, obviously. And then the other thing is that investigating demands starting with some facts, but trying to build more facts. And so you don't know at the outset how legitimate it is, honestly. And I mean, in some ways, the uh, discovery of these uh, classified documents at the Penn-Biden Center and wherever else they found some more is a good example of that. Like, you have this initial set of findings. They seem troubling. They're, you know, the president, um, elected officials are supposed to be very careful with these documents. But we just don't know whether, how worried about it to be, you know, the Biden folks in, of course, contrast to the Trump folks are turning things over immediately, etc. But there is a prosecutor who the Attorney General Merrick Garland has appointed to look into this. He happens to be a Trump appointee. It's possible there'll be a special prosecutor to look into this issue for Biden the same way there has been for Trump. And it will be impossible to know exactly how serious and problematic all of this is until we're further down the line. Congress really has that problem because it doesn't have official subpoena power. They have their own subpoena power. They don't have criminal subpoena power. They can't, right? So like the people who didn't abide by the subpoenas, then Congress can make a referral to the Justice Department and ask the Justice Department to go prosecute that in court. Congress can't do that in its in of its own. I mean, it, actually, it probably could do something, but it hasn't chosen to go around arresting people with its sergeant of arms who don't abide by subpoenas for like 100 years. And so we're going to see a lot of throwing spaghetti at the wall and claims that this is the legitimate investigation. And I think it's just very hard to tell in real time how true that is. And, And that's a challenge for the media, frankly, in covering it. There's absolutely something to investigate with Biden's handling of classified documents. We know we have it's been reported that the classification of these documents might be the highest level, in other words, top secret. Um, And so the question is, um, what was the chain of custody? What's in them? What's the damage? Um, But the response uniformly, really, from the, the leaders of the Republicans is that this is exactly like the case with Donald Trump. And it obviously is not. And. Karl Rove, who's not exactly um, a squish, um, made this point quite clearly on TV. And the point is that Donald Trump resisted repeated attempts to get him to turn over a a huge number of documents with even more uh, um, top secret material. He constantly resisted. And there's evidence he then, in fact, obstructed efforts to find this and that that's what led ultimately when all other avenues were exhausted, the FBI to go make the uh, uh, inquiry at Mar-a-Lago for these documents. That's just totally different. And to and to put all of your initial energy upon hearing about the Biden case into trying to create equivalents gives us a real time example of what this investigative committee is is likely to be. And it's a shame because investigating the executive branch is a really worthy and useful thing, as you guys used to repeatedly point out when we used to have debates about the FISA courts, that just assuming that everybody's acting in good faith when they have the sort of fervor of, of working for the federal government behind them is not a good idea. There should be lots of oversight, but not oversight that is totally blind to the differences between evidence. Let's go back to Congress. So, so John, I want to go back to your kind of your initial point. And we, we basically know that this Congress is going to be two miserable years of theater because except with it, we briefly punctuated by terrifying moments where it looks like the entire U S economy is going to grind to a halt. Um, there's not going to be any meaningful legislation because anything the Senate passes will be rejected by the House, and anything the House passes will be rejected by the Senate, except for a must-pass government funding and debt ceiling bills. So what exactly is everyone going to do for the next two years? Like, if you are a member of the House or Senate, what do you do? I mean, can, can you just, like, is it a long weekend? It's like <laughs> MLK weekend for two years? Well, for the Kardashian wing of the Republican Party, the wing that gave... Kevin McCarthy so much trouble, the people who like to stir the pot and get fundraising and become kind of influencers in that wing of the party, there's a lot that can be done. There's a lot of, um, you know, uh, behavior on these committees, um, just various uh, antics that you can engage in to get yourself um, all of the adulation that you've been seeking. So I think there will be an uptick in that. It's hard to imagine more of it, but there's going to be more of it. 
One thing I really like, though, that the Republican that this that part of the rump group was pushing for and that they won in the rules committee is a process that is that that steals power from the speaker and that allows amendments to bills and that keeps bills focused on single issues. Now, we'll see if they're able to actually do any of this. Um, but but there's a lot in the rules package that that one should like if you if you like an, uh, a process where there are more there's more input from people and everybody gets to vote on amendments and sometimes amendments will, you know, rise or fall based on people's um, actual opinions about them as opposed to never getting to the floor because leadership has has blocked that. So there might be some interesting debates which maybe get nowhere because of the conditions you described accurately, but that force members to actually participate in the process of governing, which I kind of like. Now, Kevin McCarthy looks like he's not going to let C-SPAN cameras have the free reign that they had during the, the period of his election, which is a, which is a shrinking of transparency. Um, there's some other there's some other evidence the transparency is shrinking. So maybe all those promises that were carried out in the Rules Committee won't actually come to pass. But I have some hope that there might actually be some kind of weird legislative alliances that might show up Again, they might only be theater, but they might actually tell us something. Um, and I realize that's a small, uh, s- small benefit, maybe, but it's one I hope for. Emily, I think the the one thing that people are agitated about for for substantive reasons this week, in particular, is this debt ceiling question. That it does feel like there will be some kind of profound showdown between. House Republicans and the White House over over extending the debt ceiling, thus preventing the U.S. from going into default. Is there anything that you read or saw this week that makes you either more or less uh, cheery about this? Uh, I got less cheery because of what you said. It just seems like, you know, McCarthy and some of the Republicans are already talking about demanding huge budget cuts in exchange for raising the debt ceiling. That doesn't seem particularly realistic. The Biden people are saying we're not negotiating over this. Uh, I mean, there are a couple of, you know, there's the minting the the gazillion dollar corn coin idea that's back in play. And then there was something else about like a super high interest treasury bond. High, high interest bonds. Yeah. That, so Matt Iglesias and Matt Levine, two of the people I read consistently, Bloomberg's Matt Levine, who is a brilliant, both outlined this process whereby you could issue, the treasury could issue face bonds with a face value of $100, but you could, they could have a huge yield. And effectively, people who wanted to buy those bonds would pay the U.S. government way more than $100 for bond with a face value of 100 because they knew they were getting this massive interest payment. Um, so a $100 bond that has an interest payment of 20% is the equivalent of a $200 bond that has an interest payment of 10%. I mean, it's not exactly right, but roughly those th- things. And how does this solve the debt ceiling problem? Because the debt ceiling is based on the face value of bonds that the U.S. So, so the U.S. would just issue a bunch of bonds with a low face value, but extremely high interest rate. And so people would pay this huge amount of money. So the treasury would have all this money. Um, and the actual cost to the government in, th- in theory is the same. The, the problem with it is that it's just weird. It's like a weird thing for the, for the most powerful economy in the world and the most powerful and the treasury department, which is supposed to be the stablest, you know, issuant of, of debt in the world to be doing. It's, it's a weird thing, but it doesn't, the economics of it seem to make sense. Implicit in the gambit is instability. And, and, and you're trying to send the signal that, that the U.S. actually has its act together. One of the things that strikes me as having covered Republicans for so long, and, and particularly in Congress, is that we heard often, again and again and again, during the Clinton and Obama administrations, that business needs certainty. If there's one thing that's important in this world, it's that uh, Congress and the and the White House have to do things that give certainty to business. All this monkeying around with the debt ceiling and is totally a massive dose of uncertainty. And it only um, and so uh, it sort of goes against the orthodoxy that I spent so many years covering. Um, and and there's no. Um, I mean, there are some ways you can get around it, also possibly with a discharge petition and some other stuff, but. Um, at the moment, it is a big, uncertain thing shimmering out there. Um, and there's also some evidence that McCarthy, in order to, to win the speakership, um, you know, some of those members felt that he promised them 
that he would go to a showdown and not back down and not raise the debt limit. That like that was an absolute red line that he promised he would not cross. One of the premises of your question, John, I think is so interesting because it, it, it was for generations, this idea was the Republican Party is the party of business. I don't, I'm not sure that is true anymore. It's, it's, it's distinctly ambiguous, at least. And certain issues, sure, Republicans generally want lower taxes and lower corporate taxes and lower taxes on executives and less regulation. But on other issues, it is not the case. Slate Plus members, you get bonus segments on the GabFest every week. We love doing our extra bonus segments on the GabFest. And this week, we're going to talk about the state of the return to work. Disney announced that it's going to make its employees go back four days a week. It seemed a good occasion to talk about where we are with remote work, hybrid work, in-person work. And uh, you get that if you become a Slate Plus member by going to slate.com slash GabFest Plus. And of course, you'll also get lots of other goodies from Slate, no ads on any podcasts, unlimited reading on the Slate site, lots of other member-exclusive episodes and bonus segments. So go to slate.com slash GabFest Plus. Support for this podcast comes from WISE, the universal account that lets you send, spend, and receive money internationally. With one account for over 50 currencies, who exactly is WISE made for? It's made for jet setters and slow travelers, for seeing old friends in new places. WISE is made for business in the city and pleasure on the coast, for studying abroad and supporting your little brother's schooling back home. WISE is made for people without borders, who want to live truly global lives with ease. You see, with WISE, you always get the mid-market exchange rate whenever you convert or spend different currencies. There are no markups and no hidden fees. That's pounds to pesos, dollars to dong, just like that. Helping you save on currency conversion wherever your money takes you. WISE, it's the account that's made for the world. Join 13 million customers and learn how the WISE account could work for you at wise.com slash GabFest. The attack on three branches, the three branches of Brazil's government by supporters of former President Bolsonaro, which were eerily reminiscent of the January 6th events in the United States, have heightened a crisis in Brazil. We are joined by Marcos Nabre. He is the president of the Brazilian Center of Analysis and Planning, a think tank in Brazil. And he's also a professor in the Department of Political Philosophy at the State University of Campinas, also in Brazil. So, Marcos, you join us from Berlin. Um, so you're not in Brazil right now. But what's your sense about how Brazilians have reacted to the the attack on government buildings? Has it has it emboldened the Bolsonaro supporters or has it has it chastened them? discredited them? First of all, thank you for having me. And thanks for the question, David. The, the first thing is uh, they, they haven't been in border, no. There is a poll that um, came, came out yesterday saying that 90% of Brazilians are against what happened in Brasilia. So they are isolated. Uh, on the other side, this does not mean that the far right is isolated in Brazil. These are two different things. Because, you know, what's going on, actually, um, is who has the hegemony over the right camp in Brazil? Because in the last four years, it was the far right. And now the far right is struggling to see which branch of it will have the hegemony. So there is this institutional one who says, well... We can have our coup, because they always uh, aim at a coup, in, in, in four years, in the next election. And then there, there are people who say, we want it now. So this is, this is the kind of division. And uh, so to say, in this branch of, of the far right that wants to wait for the coup, uh, there is also divisions. And this is normal, because they lost the election. So... Uh, who who is in charge is the great question now uh, for the far right. What do you think so far of the response in terms of investigating and prosecuting and imposing some accountability for what happened? Does it seem like Brazil is taking the good steps so far, or are you concerned about either overreach or a kind of underreaction? I, I have mixed feelings about it. 
because so far, so good. But um, they didn't arrest everyone. They let a lot of people go away, and they could have arrested them. And um, the Supreme Court, and especially one justice of the Supreme Court, is taking uh, the most important steps. So we will have to wait and see. So far, it's okay, because we are really uh, trying to, to prosecute these people and get them to court, and this is all right. But uh, we don't know yet, because it's also a political question. Uh, it's an opportunity, it's a window of opportunity for the Lula government to isolate the far right. And, uh, but this will require some bold movements from Lula. And Lula is not known for making bold movements, despite of what people say. Marcos, were you, what was your reaction to the role that the military played, or more importantly, maybe didn't play, on the day of the riots, what was the expectation of the rioters in terms of what they thought the military might do? And how did you interpret the reaction from the military? This is the crucial question, I would say. Uh, because on the one side, it's clear that they didn't do anything. Just to give you an example, the presidential guard was not guarding the presidential palace. So there is something very wrong about it. They have like 1,400 people there, uh, the presidential guard, I mean, and they had like 30 or 20 people. So there is something very wrong in this. And they, they were pulled off by the Secret Service <laughs> so the day before. And so this is very suspicious. And it's also a problem because you have these camps around all the military headquarters in Brazil for the last two months. And especially the one in Brasilia was uh, Brazil's capital. It, it was the main camp and uh, the organizing one for, for the whole Brazil. And then uh, when they came back after storming the three buildings, they came back to the camp. So they wanted to be arrested or they thought they would be protected by the military. And effectively, uh, the, the military didn't allow the camp to be dissolved for a while. Uh, it was a negotiation. So we, we really don't know. Uh, we know that there was um, uh, problems, and there will be problems, but we don't know the extent of the problem uh, regarding the armed forces. And this is the crucial question because if Lula makes the bold movement he needs to make, he needs to make this bold movement also regarding the armed forces. And this is, this is a big problem for us. One of the things we've been hearing about is that people used social media to organize this protest. I also, as I understand it, the Brazilian government um, and the Brazilian courts have more power to censor social media accounts, shut them down, um, than is true here in the United States. Do you think that those powers weren't used effectively? Do you think there's just like no way to stop this kind of event and that censorship for social media just can't be effective and that if you're going to try to prevent disinformation from spreading on social media and use the government to do that, that um, it has to start earlier in the process where you're sort of trying to prevent the underlying lies that lead people to want to go? Or is, is this just sort of a misguided approach to try to center it in the first place? We don't know how, how to prevent something like this. What we can do is prepare ourselves for such events. And clearly, the preparation was poor. And there were many accomplices. Just to give you an example, they stole documents from the presidential palace. So if Bolsonaro, for instance, hypothetically, had disappeared with some of the documents, now you cannot know who did what, you know? So this is, this is clearly a, a, a big problem. So the preparation was poor 
and it's clear now. Uh, but we cannot prevent something like this. And uh, the, the Supreme Court has not all that power. It can, it can just uh, act after the fact. It cannot act before to prevent it. It's, it's, it's a tough situation. Um, because you, 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 you have also to see that there are, there are sects that think that Brazil will just fall apart with uh, Lula government. And they are convinced of that. They are convinced that this is the end of the world and they should save Brazil. How, how, how can you manage that? So Bolsonaro is not in Brazil. He's been relatively quiet. And I guess I, I'm just curious because I don't understand Brazilian politics um, at all, really. Who are the people and the forces causing this movement and this rebellion if it's not Bolsonaro directly orchestrating it? If you see, Bo- Bolsonaro for the first time organized some scattered uh, authoritarian impulses that you, uh, you see in Brazilian society since the end of the military dictatorship in 1985. They were scattered. When you have a dictatorship of 21 years, it's, of course, you raise one or two authoritarian generations. They are there. So, uh, and Bolsonaro, for the first time, not only organized and unified these scattered forces, but he also became president. So th- this, is, this is really powerful. And his objective was to turn at least one third of the population into authoritarians. I mean, we don't know exactly, but we know that some 15% of the Brazilian population are really authoritarian. Uh, the support for Bolsonaro gets up to 25%. So there are like uh, 10% that are not hardcore authoritarians. And among the hardcore authoritarians, you have these that want the coup now. And these were the people that were in, in Brasilia. So they, they are kind of not uh, lone shooters, but um, they are together. But uh, they are a kind of a fraction of this uh, authoritarian core. Who are they demographically? Are they, do they come from a particular class of society? Are they a particular economic group, particular kinds of people? What's the profile of, of Bolsonaro voters? So the more educated, the more you earn, the more white you are, the more thous you live, the more you vote Bolsonaro. So this is, this is the kind of, and, and male, of course. I'm sorry, I forgot that, but it's very important. So these are the characteristics uh, of, of Bolsonaro's uh, electorate. On the one hand, he has many assets. Not only he, because he was in government, because he left many people within the state to sabotage Lula's government but also because he has senators, he has representatives, uh, he has money, public funds. So he's in a very good position to wait for the 2026 uh, elections. So uh, this is one way to go. The other way to go is to to claim uh, for the coup now. And Bolsonaro is trying to convince these people that they should wait. But for four years, he said that uh, Brazil would fall apart if he loses. So how can he win these people back? On the other hand, he needs them because they are the hardcore supporters of an authoritarian project. So it's a thin line, you know. He wants to be uh, the institutional side of authoritarianism. And on the other hand, he needs those uh, radicals that want the coup now. So that's why he was silent. That was he was spreading messages like, uh, I was trying to, but I couldn't manage uh, to do it now, but wait, we will have uh, another, ta- uh, another time, another day to, to fight our battles and everything. But 
he couldn't convince this uh, special part of uh, his electorate that they should wait. Marco, some um, American politicians have said that he should be extradited to Brazil, but extradited for what? Has he been charged? Uh, and what do you make of that? And, and what the U.S. position should be? I would like very much the U.S. to extradite Bolsonaro. But this is, this is just the wish of a citizen. Our, our minister of justice uh, has already said that there is no reason to, to petition for extradition. So this is clear. There will be no extradition. That's not the point. What is the point uh, in this question is, will he be indicted? And then I, I have a question for you. So it took you two years to recommend the indictment of Trump. Will you get this indictment before the official campaign begins or not? Because if not, I don't know, but it seems like it's very unlikely that uh, Trump will, indict it, will be indicted. So that, that's our problem in, in Brazil too. Will, will they get really to the people who finance this? Will they get to Bolsonaro or not? And this is the big question of Lula's government. Because these people wanted to undermine Lula, Lula's authority. That's clear. They wanted to say you have not only no legitimacy to rule, but you have no authority. That's what we are doing here. And he has to show that he has this authority. That's that's the crucial point, I think. Marcus Nabre, thank you so much for coming on the Gap Fest. We'll talk to you again, I hope. Although maybe in a less, uh, a less uh, troublesome time on something more pleasant. So I hope, David. Thank you very much for the invitation. Now we turn to truly important matters of uh, global political significance. As we all know, the Anglo-American Alliance has been the backstop of freedom and of the entire Western project for the last, well, since World War II, but even before that, since dating, dating back to World War I and arguably even through the late 19th century. And it's at risk. And I think we all know why it's at risk. It's at risk because former Prince Harry has cast into shadow, into doubt, into disrepute the British monarchy. And from a perch in Montecito, California, in the American West, and the symbol, this, this place is a symbol of America and American greatness and American prosperity and America's future from the Pacific Rim where we look west. Uh, he's, he said, no more, no more should America look to England for its model, should it look to the monarchy for instruction, and uh, we should abandon, abandon our interest and instead produce podcasts and Netflix shows. So, Emily... Actually, so, John. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. He my really out. threw his back into that, didn't he? He really... We, that was, we switched that was topics late, that was and you... And you my you. goodness. You uh, really... It was. It was. Wow. Um, that was uh, extemporaneous, so, uh, was it? It's a memoir. I haven't read it. I've read a lot of interviews. John, you've been watching Harry. You seem to, you seem to have quite a crush on, the, on Henry Sussex, or whatever his name is. Well... Oh, here's what I had. Here's what I had. I had absolutely only a thimbles full of interest, frankly, in the whole royal business. I mean, I'm God love them. God love all the people who are really into it. But I just, I, the endless, 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 endless coverage is just, it just goes overboard. And the, it's just insane. So I really had... I just wanted it all to pass by. But when I heard him talking about the um, his mother and what it was like to hear about her death, and then when he described the, having to receive the grief of, um, of the citizens who came to wail about the death of his mother and that their hands were still wet when they shook his because they'd been wiping away their tears and that he felt like a phony... And that when he would take their flowers and place them with all the other flowers, he felt sort of like a, a handmaiden to grief that he wasn't experiencing. 
I felt for and understood the immense and extraordinary psychological uh, wreckage uh, in his life, which was essentially created by all of these forces that I kind of didn't have that much patience for, which is the paparazzi and the extreme interest in the royals that ended up basically hunting his mother and killing her. I mean, if there's one person who's essentially been killed by um, the kind of voracious um, attention machine, it, it was Princess Diana. And he now is trying to fight back against that machine with his book and by d taking this um, extremely public posture, um, which has all of the ironies and things that irritate people, which is it's a demand for um, kind of privacy while having a six-part Netflix special. He made $100 million on the Netflix thing. He's uh, got a great deal of money on the scale of problems in life um, that f confront humanity. Um, he's not really in the top 700, but um, his personal story and the anguish he described about his mother and, and going through that, I had a very human reaction to that. And also his description of what service uh, in the military was like as a refuge for him, a lost young man who found purpose. Um, as, you know, as he said, there's no autopilot for being prince. I mean, you have to do the job when you're in the military and how that saved him. I found that compelling from a human level. Um, all the modern day stuff, I, that doesn't, you know, I, I don't sort that, but um, that was my reaction. That's so compassionate. And now I just feel ashamed of myself for all of my snark. I mean, I can channel that uh, sense of Diana's death being horrifying. And I just think that these people's lives are circumscribed and um, just contorted in ways that must just be terrible. Like, just terrible. And yes, I, I can f feel real emotions for them when I remember that. On the other hand, this is bananas in its details, in its uh, courting attention, in the idea that the way that you seek privacy and revenge, frankly, is just like dishing and dishing and trashing everyone around you. Um, it's hard for me to respect that, even though I completely agree with you that if you take a step back and think about where it's coming from, like it, it is, I suppose, understandable. Well, I think I think you probably both things can be true. I mean, in other words, you can think the system that created this and of which he is a part is bananas and is completely warped and yet feel compassion for the warpage of his life from being born into that. Um, and I think also one other thing that really struck me is he went back to look at the police report of his mother's death, and he said, I realized that the last thing mommy saw was a flashbulb of the paparazzi. Like, that's a very, that's an extraordinary thing to be alone with the death report of your mother and looking at the twisted car that killed her and to think that and then also obviously to be wrestling with your own um, life uh, in front of a flashbulb. I don't know. There's a lot of richness there, which makes me reminds me that Shakespeare wrote about the monarchy and kings and so forth, because the extremities of their lives, um, you know, are, are a, a good stage for these things. I, I mean, I hold a different position, not surprisingly, as as a kind of quasi monarchist, which is. I am sure the royal family is one big knife fight and and it seems unpleasant and it seems like the the role is it's a really hard role to occupy and you're in the public eye and you didn't ask for it. Unlike celebrities who've chosen to pursue things which are in the public eye on purpose and del deliberately become George Clooney, big actor, uh, the royal family, you're born into it and, and therefore you you don't have a choice but to belong to it. Um. But the, 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 the and I, I haven't read the book, John, nor have I watched more than a minute or two of the interviews, so I can't speak to, to how uh, he channels this. But the point, the initial point he makes, that there are all these people who are crying, that there is a grief. There's grief because the royal family does connect with people, because it does stand in for something in, in British life, because it does make people feel connected to the nation and to each other in a way that's powerful and if they if like they have to be the 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 sacrificial uh objects if they have to live on the altar and have their hearts periodically torn out so that the rest of the country can feel things and be connected and grieve like i'm okay with that that's okay 
but I think that's a that's a that's better. That's a that's an okay system to have symbolic figures who embody the nation and who usually, you know, most of the time can conduct themselves with dignity and and can and can represent the nation as Queen Elizabeth so obviously did so ably. And and that to me is a better system than having extremely unservice minded people who are celebrities as we do in America or people who are who are such atten- narcissistic attention seekers as we do in America uh, who occupy that same role but don't do it with nearly as much grace and as much as much power. So I support the monarchy and so yes there are casualties but so what? And then what do you think about Harry essentially undermining it or trashing it along the way? Like does that make you is this, is this just part of the drama and people can live vicariously through this part too, or is it a problem? I was going to say that's part of the argument that they used to make for the monarchy, which was let the monarchy be full of drama to keep entertaining people so that the politicians can do their work without as much scrutiny. Yeah, I kind of think that's true. I mean, I really believe, like, I'm not someone who believes you can have a world without charisma or a world without charismatic leaders. And I... I'm sure there are 50 things that are wrong with this, but I think having that charisma put on people who haven't chosen it, who aren't intrinsically charismatic and who actually have a duty of service is a better situation than where we have it in the U.S., where it put, gets put on people who are ex- massive ego- egotists and you end up with, in the extreme, things like Trump. And then even in the not extreme, you know, people like Kanye West. I'll take the dignity. I'll take the the, the relative dignity of what the British monarchy gives, even if, even if it does mean that there are, you know, they, they have to live tragic and, and stunted lives and they have family conflicts that are unpleasant. Okay. But then I'm just going to bring this down from this high minded plane here. So then how do you factor in like hearing about how Harry had a frostbitten penis or the, um, fight over the dress of, um, Oh, my God. I can't believe I know this person's name. Princess Charlotte, who is the daughter of um, William and Kate. And what do you think about the all the sibling fracas that's going on? Because, I mean, this book is called Spare because Harry sees himself as the spare for Prince William. And a lot of his anger is seems to be uh, directed at William and Kate and their rejection of his wife, Meghan. And this is like a really... Uh, serious inter-sibling battle that is not dignified in the slightest. So are you feeling concerned about all of this airing of dirty laundry? Does it help or hurt to have someone dishing like this? It would be better for that family. It would be better for Harry himself. And it would be better for William if he didn't write this book. (laughs) Like this book will do so much damage to that family and, 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 internally to the family as to whether it will damage the family externally in the world of the public. I don't know. Like it might, it might not. I mean, it's everything is content, right? Like it's the whole family is content. And so. And what of the people who believe the monarchy because of its role essentially in um, giving cover to the great colonization of other lands that essentially the monarchy monarchy probably should wither away and that this is maybe a good thing that the monarchy and all of its charismatic benefits that you talk about um, also has an incredibly uh, ugly side that led generations of people to operate on the behalf of the monarchy to the subjugation and death of huge swaths of people. Um, And that maybe this whole project is an anachronism that needs to go away. Right. We've had this discussion before on the Gabriel. Right. And so, I come back to the idea that I don't think it takes the, the monarchy. I don't think it takes the monarchy to, to create to create suffering, global capitalism, a slave trade. You know, people have been perfectly capable of carrying that out without a monarchy. See the United States. Um, so the monarchy is. But why? But, but do you want to keep the institutions around um, that were a part of that? In other words, is this a living statue? Uh, that needs to be um, taken down. And in that case, are you... Uh, 
it's a living statue on, to you know if you believe that including the best parts of it and the, all the terrible parts of it it's a living statue to to the england of of queen elizabeth the first and shakespeare and the the kind of the the royal patronage of the arts it's a it's a living tribute to a statue to all of those things because great britain is this massively complex country with an incredible history which is which has beauty in it and horror in it so uh i don't think i mean should they also pull down saint saint paul's cathedral should they also pull down westminster abbey should they also pull down uh uh wembley stadium i mean all of those things are also part of a, a history of British, uh, British, uh, a- ambiguous history of Britain. Well, those are a little more attenuated from the monarchy. There are a significant group of people in Britain who have uh, mi- mixed feelings about the monarchy. However, Harry's um, support within his home country seems to have dwindled considerably, which then makes me wonder about why he's such a hero in the States where they love the monarchy too. So he's like both a heartthrob in the States, even though he's undermined this thing that people in America also really love. Well, yeah, but also Americans like to mock the whole thing, too. So it's sort of per- and he moved here. So he's, you know, acting like a kind of loud, boorish American. We can kind of celebrate that. And then the undermining of it becomes part of the story. Let's go to cocktail chatter when uh, you're knocking back a stiff one. What is the royal drink? What if if you're royal? What do you? What is the royal booze, John? Uh, I don't nice. know. It's gin and whatever tonic? it is, it just keeps pouring and all day. G and T. If you're knocking back a G and T, Emily, uh, with with uh, Megan and with the Sussexes, the Sussex team, what are you going to be chattering about to them? I want to recommend a new, I think, six part podcast series that is coming out from Josie Duffy Rice, who is a friend of the Gabfest. It's excellent. JDR has a pod. Yeah, it's really good so far. Uh, It's coming out from iHeartRadio, I think, in the next week. It's called Unreformed. And it's a story of a facility that opened, I think, in the early 20th century for black children in Alabama called Mount Megs. And the horrifying things that happened there, but also this courageous effort by a few girls who ran away to um, expose what was going on there. And I thought the first episode, Josie did an amazing job of giving you a sense of hope and how people's lives, how the survivors of this place like had gone on despite it all to thrive. And that um, made me more interested um, to keep listening about what happened to them. So unreformed, Get it wherever you get your podcast. Josie Duffy Rice, iHeartRadio. That sounds great. John, what's your chatter? Two things. One, there's a, um, a piece by David Wallace Wells, um, in his Times newsletter, that um, charts the rise of electric vehicles. Um, there are now, worldwide, there are now almost 30 million electrical vehicles on the road, up from 10 million just in 2020. Um, it just sort of nicely charts... Well, oh my gosh, they're they're really coming. They're, it's not just, you know, a few of your quirky friends. It's really happening. And that was then affirmed by the fact that two of the three North American car, truck, and utility vehicles of the year were electric vehicles, including the Ford F-150, which is the most popular car in America. The only thing that makes more money as a consumer product in America than the Ford F-150 series is the iPhone. So the F-150 Lightning is the named the truck of the year and the Kia EV6 is the utility vehicle of the year. So it's all happening. The electric cars are coming and they're like, they're already here. Also, just a shout out to um, Kevin Ryan, the um, outgoing president of Covenant House, who um, uh, is has been an amazing leader of that organization and helped thousands and thousands of kids who are homeless Um changed their lives and who's helped just generally um, roll the stone towards ending youth homelessness um, and has been an incredible model. Um, I'm on the board of Covenant House and just watching him do his work all over the world, tirelessly, lovingly, it's just an extraordinary thing. So um, huzzah to Kevin for that work. My chatter. Uh, First, I want to thank you all for the outpouring of sympathy about my cat tulip who died the day after we taped the gap fest last week um so many of you sent so much sympathy and kindness and i'm i'm really grateful and i especially grateful to christine rusen who sent me a poem which is like 
Viking, or actually probably it's Ersatz Viking, that really made me weep about a cat, a, a dead cat. And um, I actually cannot bring myself to read it out loud, uh, but it was so moving to me. And I'll, if anyone wants to see it, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, my actual chatter is about an incredible story in the New York Times about the restaurant Noma, which is closing as a regular restaurant. Um, it was a famous uh Chef Rene Redzepi, Redzepi, who created this extraordinary restaurant in Copenhagen, and people would fly thousands of miles to be there. And it's a, it's an amazing story just about the the life at a high end restaurant. But in particular, there was this detail about ha- they they have twenty to thirty people who were interns, and they were unpaid interns until re- very recently, when basically they were guilted into starting to pay them. And these were people who um, would come from around the world and work for several months for and they'd have to pay their own living expenses um while they were there just to get the credential of saying i was a stagiaire i was an intern at noma and there was this amazing account from one woman who'd come from india namrata hegdi and she came in 2017 and her sole job over three months was to produce fruit leather beetles she had a thick jam of black fruit silicone stencils which had in, insect parts. So she spread the jam and then it the dried, monitored the jam as it dried, then used tweezers to assemble the pieces into a, a fruit leather beetle. And she would make 120 perfect beetles every day. And that was her job. That was her job. She said she was required to work in silence and she was specifically forbidden to laugh. I just think like, I hope this place goes burnt doesn't just like go out of business that it burns down. We are we've gone so far off the deep end in fine dining in this world. It's an embarrassment. We should we are absolutely at the you know late Roman banquet uh, being served plovers eggs, uh, you know, and 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 grapes fed into our mouths uh, stage of the world. It's it's awful. Plus, the fruit leather beetles you can get from Trader Joe's are totally adequate. It's true. Totally, um, that's absolutely. When you're making your 149th fruit leather beetle, what is it that is driving you as a kind of larger purpose that anyone ever, because it's like, this is the way of these kitchens. And so how do people get through it? What is what is it that they are told or they tell themselves about the larger purpose? There's this line that stone cutters always must be imagining cathedrals, you know, that to get through the work of cutting the stone, you have to think about its final product. So is that it? I don't know, but I want to know. Well, I mean, a, a, a lovely uh, restaurant experience means a lot to people. I mean, we're all like, I mean, not real foodies, but, you know, we're all interested in food and you get one gets a tremendous amount of joy and pleasure. And so I'd imagine that you're paying your dues in an establishment like that because you have a uh, idea of a different kind of restaurant that's going to be warm and inviting and treat people well and this is the step that you have to take to get there. Yeah, and you and you learn how to be disciplined, you learn how to work in a team. You I mean this even this intern said she it taught her to be quick, quiet and organized. Um and and if you do have Yeah, it's a craft and also you're looking ahead to the future, which is we all take, you know, we all we all uh apprentice ourselves in various ways in our work and i think people in the food business are accustomed to accustomed to apprenticeships and are accustomed to people treating them pretty badly as well listeners you sent chatter to us every week you tweet them to us at slate gabfest and you email them to us at gabfest at slate.com you sent a bunch of really good ones this week and uh i found the one that we are hearing today so delightful and weird and it comes from eric morgan besser hello emily david john and fellow gabfest listeners eric morgan besser from melbourne australia here when sifting my gin cocktail this weekend i'll be chattering about a series of ai generated images where someone has used the name of a country and the word villain as prompt there are 33 remarkable pictures where a country's history culture and essence have been personified into an eerie entity In my opinion, the scariest one is Canada's. It's a mutated stag-like creature against a bleak city backdrop. UK, with its steampunk-inspired colonial-era soldier, is the coolest, and Australia's, sadly, is the most boring with just a stereotypical boxing kangaroo. 
Credit goes out to the Twitter user CryptoT who first brought them into the light. Check them out. That's our show for today. The Gap Fest is produced by Shana Roth. Our researchers, Bridget Dunlap. Our theme music is by They Might Be Giants. Ben Richmond is Senior Director for Podcast Operations. And Alicia Montgomery is the VP of Audio of Slate. Please follow us on Twitter at, at SlateGabFest and tweet chatter to us there or email it to us at gabfest at slate.com. For Emily Bazelon and John Dickerson, I'm David Plotz. That's Duke David Plotz to you. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Hello, Slate Plus. How are you? So Disney ha- is going to order its employees to come back to the office four days a week. And it's the latest in a series that's cutting back on its hybrid and remote work. And it seems like workers who had so much leverage a year ago are now scared of losing their jobs and have much less ability to resist demands that they return to an office that, that some people are ambivalent about. And And so we want to sort of talk about the state of the state of the return to the office. Um, and I and I think we should caveat this at the start by saying this is obviously only a very limited sample of the economy. These are 10, the, 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 the people we're talking about are people who are working in sort of office jobs, which are tend to be infor- knowledge workers, information professions, where you can have a hybrid or work remote environment. You cannot change a tire remotely. Um, you, you cannot do surgery remotely. Uh, so, um, where do you guys think we're going to end up? Do you think, do you think we're, we've reached the, We've reached the end point. Like, you know, now it's about people, half, half of knowledge workers seem to be going back to the office about half the time. Or I mean, people are, excuse me, most knowledge workers are going back to the office, but it's about half the time. Or do you think we're going to get back to where we were before pandemic? I think we get back to where we were before pandemic, especially now that the economy is where it is. Iger is making a case and Musk has made the case and all the investment banks are making the case that physical proximity is important. And if it gets attached to your economic stability, then you're going to show up. But having said that, New York City um, uh, is putting forward this program where the the mayor has suggested that um, New York turn a lot of its empty office buildings into residential housing. Um, And it requires a lot of, you know, hoops to be jumped through um, before that can happen. But the basis is not only the need for affordable housing in New York City, but also the conclusion that they've drawn um, that uh, the occupancy rates in downtown New York of the office buildings are not going to increase. Um, and uh, I talked to... That was just a snippet from our Slate Plus conversation. If you want to hear the whole conversation... Go to slate.com slash GabFestPlus to become a member today.